three, we're live. Welcome, Brian Barrett, to my podcast. Today, um, we've got guest Brian Barrett, the magician. Um, we're going to be talking about how we become spellbound by the media, by other people, and what to do about it. Hi, Go ahead. Hi, how are you doing? Good-ish, Good. yeah. Okay. Let, let's have a look at realistically what spell binding is. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's having your attention fixed, a fascination, um, a hypnotism, being mesmerized, enchanted, if you wish. Now, we do it to ourselves quite a lot. Yeah. However, being enchanted, being spellbound, is often done out of awareness. Um, one of the most common ways of being spellbound is through infatuation. Uh, when we're younger, we can become very infatuated with things not necessarily the opposite sex. We might be infatuated with motorcycles. We might be infatuated with cars. We might be infatuated with a lot of things. However, if you speak to the mystics, if you speak to people who are enlightened, they will often tell you that um, infatuation, being spellbound, is very tied into desire which I presume it is. However, it, it can also manifest in other ways as well. Uh, being Christian doesn't save you from being spellbound. If you listen to Christians, they'll often talk about a priest or someone of that nature being hypnotic or full of the holy spirit but once again you know this person is projecting their personality into their audience and of course one of the greatest examples of a nation being spellbound or nations being spellbound was probably during the wars and if we you know there's sort of like if we look at say the second world war in particular and the way that Adolf Hitler could hold his people, but in very much the same way Winston Churchill held his people as well. You know, so it's a very, very powerful, if you like, magical act, which we all use either on ourselves or by projecting it to other people. And it's very interesting how even intelligent people can fall for it. I mean, we, we can see it everywhere where you go. I mean, for example, during this coronavirus crisis, many people wear masks, where the scientific evidence for masks is, is virtually nil. And essentially, people wear them, and they will fight to the death to assure you that they work. This is a... This is a direct result of being spellbound. I mean, there are many stages of being spellbound, but generally speaking, when it starts to alter your behavioral patterns and you start to act differently and be different, then essentially one is spellbound. And that happens because there has been implanted some kind of desire to want to act in another way. Essentially, an another version of spellbinding is television or even the internet, because their adverts are so slick and so clever, they hook straight into the desire to get something, to want something or to be like something, or to be like somebody. Maybe you've come across the same yourself. 
Yeah, I quite like Kim Kardashian. I suppose if she was advertising a lip gloss, I'd probably go and buy it just because she's so lucky, you know, and you think, oh, maybe some of the luck will rub off. Yeah, I mean, I mean that, that's one example. But I mean, I mean, lipstick is um, or lip gloss is, is is quite brutal in my opinion. Once again, it it it's very, if you like, it, it, it it's very magic orientated. Like for is example, it? yeah, yeah, yeah. If, but you know, you think you're being, you, you know, you you're buying lipstick. You, you, you're not. You 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 you're actually performing a ritual. And the people who sell you the lipstick are part of that ritual. I mean, you know, so if, if you're actually going to be, you know, looking at it, they wear white coats. Yeah. OK. Yeah. Now, maybe they have some kind of some of them have some kind of medical training. But generally speaking, a lot of these women will just go from school. They go and work for one of the major cosmetic companies and part of the cosmetic company is to get a white coat and they will tell you all kinds of things to do with the cosmetic to give you lots of confidence in this cosmetic etc 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 but realistically sort of you know all these all these lipsticks um they tie into what what we understand as sort of you know colors of power yeah and they allow if you like the wearer a certain amount of prowess it's you well know, that's it's, interesting because um lush up on the king's road they mm -hmm. do have a a thing where you can go in and it's four lipsticks and eyeshadows and you you press a button in the middle about how you feel. If you're feeling low confidence, press that. Feeling unattractive, press that. And then it brings you up either the eyeshadow or the lipstick that you need to wear. And I remember always getting the one, it's a red color and it's called Ambition. And putting it on, I do feel, right, I'm set to, to do something, to strike out in the world. It's really, it's really a great color. It's a great lip gloss, I mean. No, yeah, I, mean, I love you know, it. You just pop, you just performed a ritual, haven't you? Yeah. You know, you know essentially, you know. So, I mean, uh, this this type of ritual goes back to to the earliest records. Um, if we look at sort of, you know, what is ritual? I mean, people think that ritual is sort of getting getting dressed and meeting these people in the woods or getting undressed and meeting these people in the woods and saying incantations and, and acting in a certain way. It's actually not. I mean, ritual can be as simple as um, wearing the watch that whenever you've worn the watch, you've always had successful business meetings. Yeah. For example, mm -hmm. the, you know, the, there's quite a lot of totemism concerns with, say, football. I, I know footballers who won't wash their scarf because if they wash the scarf, it'll wash the lookout and their team will lose. Yeah. Right. And, you know, come on, this is the 21st century. You know, do you really think that's the case? But, but, but this is how subtle, you know, the, the, the art of ritual is so to speak well there was a there was a, a thing when i was at school there was a lip gloss and it was a max factor roll-on lip gloss and i haven't and that was when i was about i think nine and i haven't forgotten it in all these days and the advertising campaign was lois lane um being picked up by superman and she had the gloss on it was a roll-on in a red kind of a it was glass gunky liquid and it came in passion fruit peppermint and the magic was that you wear the roll on and then you'll get picked up by superman you have superpowers it was a whole dream attached to that and i never forgot that lip gloss i mean if i could get hold of that i'd be very happy which is strange isn't it i mean just the lip gloss well not really i mean you know essentially um i mean the whole superman thing 
it, it, I mean, essentially, he goes back to Greece, doesn't he? I mean, he's Heraclitus, yeah. You know, the the, the you know the the great half man, half god, and essentially, Superman is is an extraction from that from that ethos. Um, however, if if you read the story of Heraclitus, he's he's not really a nice person. Um, he's very He's very prone to act on his emotion. Um, in the story, the original story is that um, Hera doesn't like him because he's another, if you like, prodigy of her husband, Zeus, and she sends a snake to kill him. Of course, he kills the snake when he's a baby. Um, Zeus tries to make her make him feed off the goddess's breast, which he half does, hence that's why he's half superhuman and half god, so to speak. The breast milk goes into the universe, which allegedly is the Milky Way. However, he's not, he's not there's, there is nothing what you would call divine about him. Oh, you know, he's, he, he's, he's, a, he's a person who, who really um, runs on his emotion, and he's he's he is uh, he does sort of like pay respects to whoever he kills, but essentially his whole life is to kill. But once again, if we go back to being spellbound, Hera spellbinds him, and he kills his family without understanding that he's killed his family. You know, I mean, if we look at this from a purely al allegorical, you know, sort of um, viewpoint, when one is spellbound, you're not aware of it. It's only until you come out of the spellbind that you actually realize that you were spellbound, as in the tale of Heraclitus or Hercules. He kills his entire family in a blind rage. And he doesn't understand this. And it's only when his family are dead and he comes out of the bind that he realizes what he's done. And I think that that's the thing about being spellbound is, is that it it's often happens when we least expect it. Well, we were talking about serial killers earlier and perhaps Jeremy Bamber who killed his own family. I've always thought that there was something about those murders that, um, that you know, he went into a trance or, or something affected him because he, he said to his girlfriend that he was scared he was going to shoot his family. And then days later, he shot them. It's not really like he planned it, is it? If you say to somebody, I'm scared that I'm going to do something, you know, and then you, you go ahead and do it, that doesn't say you've got a lot of control. Well, yeah, but I mean, but, it, but if you look at, say, uh, I don't know, if you look at sort of um, cinema, for example, yeah, mm -hmm. um, I mean, cinema is, you know, it, it deals with the archetype. Now, the male archetype, of course, is um, Hercules or Heraclitus. And essentially, you know, he's somebody who can fight armies by himself, et cetera, et cetera. And there is this haunting sort of tale where he kills his family. So we've really, you know, so, so, you know, this, this tale is reproduced and reproduced so many, many times. And, it, and if you don't really understand what this tale is about, you, you can really convince yourself that, that you're actually, you know, following through a much deeper wish and not be aware of it. And like you said, you know, oh, I'm frightened, I'm going to kill my family. Yeah, I mean, you know, where do you think this negativity came from? Where do you think this is this absolutely, you know, sort of stupid idea that he, you know, that killing your family is going to somehow give you some kind of redemption? You know, well, he didn't like, like them, clearly. Well, we don't know that. That, that. That's the worst side of the. That's sort of the worst side of the no, situation. No, I, I, I think he didn't like them. Maybe he was adopted. His mother was a bit of a bitch, so it was a typical adoptive, unhappy family of a very controlling mother. In all these cases, that that is there. 
these adoption cases, you know. Um, okay, if, if you, I mean, I mean, if you liked her or, or didn't like her, this still comes down to the fact that, like, taking a revolver or a rifle or shooting somebody, you know, where did that idea come from? You know, what, what archetype gave him the idea that that was going to be the appropriate action? Yeah? Okay. I don't know. So this is, you know, this is the danger of being spellbound. And it, you know, it's very, very powerful. I mean, if we look at World War One, you know, sort of, you know, millions of people died. Yeah. And, and they died for the sketchiest ideology, realistically. And how do you do that? You know, how do you get men of sort of like 17 to sort of 24 to sort of like give their lives up for nothing more than ribbons and some really no mark prince who got killed and yet, yet you're going to die for this and you're going to live in squalor you know what what, what kind of manipulation does that take you know so you know when when people say that you know like magic doesn't exist or occultism is bizarre you've only got to look around and see how many people are wearing masks you've only got to look at world war ii and allegedly how hitler killed people in the concentration camps because he didn't like the race they were but how does somebody then go to the same concentration camp who doesn't maybe have the same pathological hate and then perform this action for someone who has the same pathological hate. You know, there, there's a lot of spellbinding. There's a lot of allowing people to encapsulate your world so that they want to act in a similar way. You know, so do you think people like that have, um, like, you know, we talked earlier about the Hillside Stranglers and, and Bianchi, who you said, and I agree, um, you know, possessed by Jin, but he managed to get his cousin, Angelo, to join in this murdering women and torturing women and throwing them in the street when they'd finish with them. Um, well, yeah, it's, it's all about, it's, it's all about, you know, sort of like spellbinding again, you know, sort of like if, you, if we sat down, and said, okay, we're going to go out tonight and we're going to kill a few people and it'll be really, really great. You would think that I was sort of this side of idiotic and I would be this side of idiotic. However, you know, it, when you meet these heavily psychopathic people, they have this very, very strong persuasive personality and they encapsulate you very quickly into their world. Once again, it's part of the spell maneuver. You know, one minute you're a normal person, next minute you're holding the gun for a psychopath in a nightclub because he wants to kill somebody and it happens within seconds. I mean, many, many times, um, uh, you know, this happens to sort of like, you know, sort of younger people who have not got quite the if you like the nous to sort of work out what's happening but like you know the people often say how does somebody take a load of drugs with a teddy bear onto a plane well they meet somebody with a little bit of charisma they feel really great they feel wonderful it gives them the teddy bear bang they walk on the plane he then probably rings them up and tells them that they actually have drugs in the teddy bear so they arrest them and they don't concentrate on the one that actually has the drugs you know, the, you know. So how do people do that? How do people persuade people in well, that way? Know. How does it begin? Well, it begins like anything else. Essentially, that they are incredibly exciting. Most people's lives are quite quite mundane. So, generally speaking, if you give people excitement and money, then they will be responsive to you. If you give them excitement money and sex i can guarantee they will be exciting to you for example if we look at the epstein case how does he get 14 and 13 year old girls to go to an island who can barely speak money. english money well, okay so you know you're 13 years of age and someone comes up to you and says i'll give you well, not 13 um we're maybe older 
No, they were all really young. Did. Yeah, you know, sort of 13, 14. You know, I don't care who you are, but if someone says to you, I'll give you £30,000 if you want to come to, um, you know, my island, I'll fly you there. It'll be really great. Oh, I, would, I would go. You would go? Would you? Well, I, once again, it depends what the background is. You know, I mean, you know, sort of... But, depends you know, what your background was. If you come from a solid family where you're valued, you don't go. If you come from somewhere where you're a throwaway, you do go because you're seeking love as well. You're seeking being treated um, like you're special. I suppose that's why people from bad backgrounds, they often end up murder victims and because they no, but, are always but, but, hunting for something they haven't got. Well, I mean, the one thing that, they, that they've skipped around a lot with the Epstein is, is that most of the girls they abducted were like, from Latvia and sort of places like this, you know, where, where they're classically beautiful. There was very few sort of, um, if you like, fluently English speaking hmm. victims. And the ones who were fluently um, speaking in English are the ones who were complaining, so to speak. Hmm. And, hmm. you know, once again, this was, you know, this was all part of like the manipulation. But, but once, you know, but once again, you've got to ask yourself, how does somebody get a bunch of girls to fly halfway around the world to then become, if you like, call girls to be the sort of nicest variation of it, but being realistic that, you know, they're being prostitutes. And then- Do you think, when, do you think it was, do you think it was him and he had that sort of special- charisma. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. sure. Yeah, and, and also what's it, his, his, um, his girlfriend, his, Bizet Maxwell, she, you know, she, you know, she, she's also had this sort of wonderful, um, charismatic personality, which, you know, which, which could pull you into their world. You know, I mean, just saying somebody, oh, I'm going to give you 60,000 quid if you sleep with a few princes, you know, sort of like, I don't think it washes. Yeah, you know, because you know, these girls are like young girls, they're like 13, 14, you know, so, but you know, how they trap them into sort of like wanting to completely change your lifestyle and change, you know, not being at home think, and going I somewhere think else. With the, with the girl, wasn't the girl who slept with Prince Andrew 17 or six, something like that? No, th that was the American girl, wasn't it? Yeah, the uh, American girl. Yeah, yeah. I, I think she was, I think she was like 15 or something, you know. But I think, I mean, I was in care at 15. I would have, if someone said to me, you can sleep with someone famous. I'd have my hand up at the front, you know. I think if if you're a girl that hasn't been valued by your father, you're pretty much out there used, and you know, I mean. Yeah, but I, I mean that that that's you, but 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 I mean that you know, how do you get another sort of forty or fifty to do it? Which is what they, you know, the numbers were dealing with. You know, they they weren't just pulling one or two. You know, there was sort of like... a lot of girls that aren't valued by their families. I, I think girls aren't valued by their families much actually i don't know well i mean uh, the trouble uh, is... i mean i know a girl I, I i know a girl who slept with um a whole football team you know she went into their she told me this story she went into um their locker room and they all slept with her one after another she told me with, with, with a lot and some of my friends um when i was young when i was 14 15 they told me about oh got gangbanged last night and I'd be like what and they'd be like yeah there was like 15 there or you know I mean this goes on with women that the girls that haven't been valued by their parents especially the father figure it's a failure of, of the father actually that whole uh, thing of girls chucking themselves away girls being prostitutes girls um letting um 15 guys one after another and and thinking it's not really a trauma you know yeah, but, but once again that you know that 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 goes you know really deep because we we view the world from our perspective yeah okay uh -huh. um however you know sort of yes there are girls and women who behave like that but on another level uh, you could have a 13 year old and they don't even know what sex is, you know, mm. to put it bluntly. You know, I, I mean, the, the trouble is, is, is that the further you are away from love, 
and I don't mean the fluffy clouds and the bears, you know, the, the further you are away from the divine, whatever, you know, whatever the divine is for yourself, yeah? And when one is not loved, one will look for love in other things, yeah? You know, yeah. outside of themselves. You know, for example, um, if, a, if, if a man doesn't particularly love themselves, or a woman for that matter, they will try and give themselves the best they can. You know, they, they will sort of like work particularly hard, they, or, or they will become, you know, very work orientated, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So they can lavish themselves with cars and clothes and watches and all these material trappings, because essentially, going back to what you said, you know, they don't have the motherly and fatherly love. So they get it from things which will give them comfort. Yeah. And in some cases, it might be drugs. So in some cases, it might be nice cars, nice clothes, nice buildings. However, you know, these are desires and these desires are part of the person's sort of like, if you like, uh, wish list, you know, it's, it's not called a wish list because it's a good word. It's because they essentially, they wish for it. And if you're wishing for it, then it's very quickly able to become spellbound. And, you know, and then if you like dream weavers, like Maxwell, you know, like his assistant can, can sell you this, if you like, this, this hedonistic um, spark. And it can easily go. Uh, it, it's really interesting. Um, like I said, you know, so although most of the girls were like foreigners and barely spoke English, there doesn't seem to be a cue of them complaining about the lifestyle that, that they got, you know. It's, I, well, it's well, like somebody said to me about, you know, working for the news of the world and, oh, you know, you can't expect to, to not get shit. You work for the news of the world. I mean, but I was your stereotypical girl, would have got suckered in by Epstein, you know, that was um, in care. Then, you know, I dated this reporter. He wrote about me and I remember sitting in a pub with him I had nowhere to live I was bed hopping journalist to journalist some of them didn't abuse me others did and um they showed me you know all those guys over there there was these guys and they were dressed in like black crombies mm -hmm. they were smoking cigars they had a few um I think Dot from EastEnders was with them um some really gorgeous page three models in this wine bar and they exuded an air of, um, it was evil, they did exude evil, but they also exuded a kind of um, exciting dark power. And I remember this journalist saying to me, oh, I wanna work for the news of the world. And I took one look at those men and I just wanted to, to know them, to, you know, to sort of, I just, I, it, they were like wizards almost, you know? And I, I did eventually, have a sexual relationship with a, one of them you know I worked for the paper and then I had a sexual relationship with one of them and you know he pretty much got me to do what he wanted he got me to get in cars with um, taxi drivers who were rapists looking for blonde victims he got me to go in houses with people that were highly dangerous until I met a boyfriend and the boyfriend I was telling this boyfriend what I did for a living and he, he said Oh, where, where's your boss? You know, where is he? It was Greg Miskew. He said, where is he? I said, he said, I want to meet him. And I said, oh yeah, you think it's the old Rose. So he drove me down there, got out of the car. He said, where is he? And I said, oh, he's sitting me over there. There he was with his crombie and surrounded by acolytes. And um, this guy, I just really met him. He said, what have you drink? I said, oh, Johnny Walker. Got him a double Johnny Walker, slammed it down in front of him. And he said to him, next time you have one of your jobs, you get your daughter to do it. He said, or oh, better still, you get your wife to do it. He said, do you understand me? And he pushed his drink at me. He said, drink that. And, um, you know, I was dropped pretty soon after that. But it's that kind of thing, you know, like the newspapers were very much that Jeffrey Epstein kind of nasty, dark, um, you go and do this, you go and score drugs over there. Isn't that illegal? 
no, it's not. You work for us. And, you know, that kind of, and I was trying to explain to this person, um, you know, I was pretty much used as a sort of a cool girl. You know, that was my, I didn't become a hooker. I nearly probably did. I was certainly on the street. I had nowhere to go. And um, certainly used, you know, I was lucky I got through working for the news of the world without being dead. As I was telling you this morning, I certainly have got post-traumatic stress disorder. I've got panic attacks over it. I'm really nervous. You know, they pretty much squeezed me out. Um, and what they pay you doesn't equal, um, you know, the, the, the abuse. But then I wasn't one of their journalists. You know, I was working as an investigator, stroke, um, tart really you know you go along and be the tart which in a way is like is like you were saying and you know who was controlling me but these enigmatic editors and one of them was Russian Alex Marinchek and I was totally in awe of him I mean he he would take me out and he would pick his fingers and go um bring us a spread of, of, of food and bring us a good wine no 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 champagne he would tell me how intelligent I was how we'd never met someone who was as intelligent as me. And I was just literally, whenever he said to do something and he would come up close and he would whisper in my ear, do a good job for us. And I would be just, you know, like a late freight. I would be, I would need to get a result for him. And it's that kind of, um, you know, that kind of being under a spell. You know, I remember when I got turfed out by them, I felt, and I actually was that that way. I, I likened it to being in an army, um, an SS, and all of a sudden finding yourself a civilian. But it was almost like being part of a world that was magical, very powerful, and exuded a spell probably over the nation, and then um, being a mundane. All of a sudden, I wasn't with them. I wasn't protected by them. If you know, I ever got shoddy treatment by anybody, I would say news of the world and they would come groveling around me and I didn't have I didn't have them to it was like daddy you know there was no daddies around anymore and I really felt as if all the magic was snatched away it was horrible I don't think people say to me you know you have done much but I think you know news international it's you know it's I didn't really get over being pushed out by them I didn't ever really get over that loss because even though it's evil there's the magic side there do you know what i mean of course there's magic there yeah i mean no it's, it's essentially they're selling you everything that you want you want money you want power you know you you want to be able to influence so you know you, you know that is the spell you know the spell you know as, I, as i've told you many times you know sort of like people say oh magicians magic you know blah 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 it doesn't work well you just pointed out it does work you created a reality and you brought people into that reality and you manipulated that reality for, for, for the result that, that was needed. Yeah? These guys wanted dirt on people. You provided the dirt. They pulled them into their world. In, once they were in that world, they were victims of, as you quite rightly said it, you know, satanic magicians. Quite simple. Do you think it was satanic magicians? Well, how else? You know, I mean, you know, if, if you're whole ethos is destruction yeah okay you know it, yeah. you're, not, you're not you're not wanting to enlighten these people you know you, yeah. all you're wanting to do to these people is destroy them right you know, so, so, so you know you know so you know the, the magic realistically you know white and black magic are very very similar you know that they, they both work in the same way it, 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 you know, it's hard to believe, but it's true because that that they're both very sort of selfish types of magic. Yeah, and then and then in between we get the coloured variations. You know, but like the black magic, it's it it's pulling people into a world, and you're not caring about those people. You just want them to come into your world. And you can see the same thing on the white side. You know, say for example, um, like the Jehovah's Witnesses, they they truly believe that, that that what they do is 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 going to help somebody's salvation. However, the person once they're into that realm, once they're into that sort of like lifestyle, 
you know, the person who they was, you know, it has gone. Yeah. You know, it's completely gone. And it's the same if you go into the darker side, the person that you was has gone. You know, so, you know, this this is really black magic. You know, this isn't caring about people. This is just about manipulating somebody for your means you know you're just thinking well, what, what, was, what was what was interesting now you're talking about this what was interesting they used to call um they used to call when they got information on people they used to call it the kill and then whoever was going along to tell the victim you know that they got all this information on them whatever they would call it they would call it the kill like this um this guy i know at the priory Paul Mark Collins, he was having an affair with a patient and they got all this stuff on him and they went along and he said he saw a sadistic glint in the eye of the journalist who spoke to him. And I said, well, you would. I said, because they call that the kill. They literally do and they call it the blooding. So that's maybe they're like a ritual blood sacrifice. Of course it is. Yeah. You know, you don't have to, you know, you, you don't have to kill. I mean, you, you, you know, it, it borders very much on what you call vampirism. You know, taking every bit of energy away from that person. You know, I mean, sort of. It's it's this is you know this is this is what really annoys me when people say that you know there is no such thing as magic, there's no such thing as witchcraft, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's all hocus pocus. Well, essentially, you can see just by your tale that is how the operation works, and it works on desire. You know, that's the main key. If the man didn't desire you to go into the car, then it would never happen. However, this desire goes right back. You know, the, the more your life is ruled by lust and desire, the nearer you come to people who will feed on that lust and desire. As Maxwell has pointed out, there's not there's hardly any famous people that we love and respect that we see on the TVs and the movies who have not been to Maxwell's Island. They all have their excuses as to why they've been to Maxwell's Island. However, the fact remains they've been to Maxwell's Island. There are pictures of Bill Gates next to Maxwell. There are pictures of Prince Andrew next to Maxwell. You know, the one thing it tells to me is it's the darkest magic you could possibly want because these people don't care about who they are using. They are just using them. And in return... So interestingly as well, um, even though I don't like the Catholic Church, there was a lot of targeting of priests, a lot of it. And I thought, oh, great, you know, because I felt that they had a hand in my sexual abuse, giving me to these pedophiles as a child. I grew up in the Crusader Rescue, as you know, which were run by the Jesuits. So I wanted revenge on, on the Catholic Church. And they used to get lots of tips from this one and that one about the Roman Catholic Church, you know. And so that was interesting. And also there was, there was a blackmail that went on. There was, you know, sometimes they would find out about these young soap stars who'd had abortions and they would say to them, oh, you can leak on what your co-stars are doing in certain soaps. Um, again, in this case, it was EastEnders or, um, you can give us an exclusive about how you lost your baby. Um, I saw that go on. That really shocked me. They did it to someone quite famous. I won't say their name, but they said to her, you've got a choice. <laughs> and you can um, cough about to us about how you lost your baby or we say you killed it. I mean... Yeah. Well, there you go. There, you know, there, there, there's the spelling operation. But what does it mean? What does it mean for for those um, for those at the top? What does what does it mean? Um, what does it mean? You know, the people at the top of, of places of organisations like that. Oh, actually, you're the man to ask about this. This mm -hmm. is interesting. Now, Nick Davies, uh, and just to say for the listener about you know Brian Harvey's criticising me working for the news of the world, but I was a victim of the press. Then they dragged me in as one of their little 
girls. Um, so yeah, and I've talked about that. That's why I'm coming out and talking about it now. Um, back to what I was, um, the point I was going to make, Nick Davies um, came to me and said, because I was a private detective, I wasn't ever a journalist, I wanted to be, um, and I got my name on certain stories, but I was a private eye. Um, when it all, when the phone hacking had gone on, there's something weird about phone hacking as well, that was involving an MI6 guy called John Boyle, his name hasn't been mentioned, so there's something weird about that. Um, but I went, I met up with this Guardian guy called Nick Davies. Well, he sent a researcher of me called Jenny, Jenny Brown, I think. And Jenny uh, from Down Dog Films, she said, oh, tell me about what it was like working for the News of the World. You know John Boyle, talk about this. And I said, well, who are you working for? And she said, oh, Nick Davis from The Guardian. And I said, well, I'll meet, meet Nick Davis from The Guardian then rather than speak to you. Um, so we arranged to meet. And um, he said, do you know John Boyle? I thought it was too dangerous to talk about Boyle. I said, I don't know him. And he said, I know that you do. Um, and I said, well, I, actually, I don't know. Too scared of Boyle. And then he said, would you talk about at least working for the News of the World? So I said, well, in what way? And he said, just, you know, what's it like to be a private detective working for them? So I thought since they dumped me out, I would. So I said, yeah, OK. And he said, well, you know, we'll arrange you to come up to the offices. Um, we need pictures. We'll have to film you. Um, so I said, yeah, fine. Um, you know, you have to pick me up from my house tomorrow. Anyway, I went home went to sleep and um, next thing in my dream, it was a white rabbit. And I thought that's really weird. And it's the first of two times when I have a white rabbit experience. Um, dreamed about these white rabbits and they all started surrounding me and they got bigger and bigger and bigger. So they were giant white rabbits. And um, next thing, I started walking on white rabbits. And they were literally under my feet. And I started to get like feeling sick because I was crunching their bones and I could see blood and flesh and fur. And um, I thought this is an occult attack. I knew enough back then um, to know it's an occult attack. So I turned around and I said to the rabbits, and there was literally millions of them stretched out and I was packed in and I'm a claustrophobic, so it was scary. And I said, who are you? And they answered back, we're Rupert Murdoch's army. And I woke up and I was literally, I almost felt fur in my throat. And um, Davis phoned me early in the morning. I said, oh, I'm not gonna do it now. And he goes, might I ask why not? And I said, yeah, a rabbit nightmare. And it was only years and years later when I interacted with that Colonel Michael Aquino to try and find out what mind control was that he, again, appeared to me um, in the astral as a rabbit. And someone said to me about Murdoch in a night of the Night of Templar or something like that. And I wondered how much the occult is linked with, with him, with that News International. I mean, what do you think about that control? I was literally controlled in a dream to not speak to him. What do you think about that? Well, I mean, like I said, you know, the, the, that is the power of the spell bound. You know, the, 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 it's, it's something which overtakes you. But the but the people who administer the spellbind, they they've done it for, they have thousands of years of experience. They know how to talk to you on so many levels. Now the 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 one thing that you haven't mentioned, you've spoken about how it was exciting, how it was attractive, but you haven't really concentrated on the abject fear. You know, if you're dealing with people who can destroy your lives or even kill you physically, then, you know, there's a lot of fear there. And if you have that fear, that is another part of the spell bind. And essentially that fear can be used to make you and manipulate you to do anything. As can also be doing good things, but we're not talking about good things. We're talking about master manipulators. We're talking about very dark, powerful magic, which only objective is to destroy. And I was you know, threatened a lot of times. If you don't do that, you'll be out. You'll be out. You'll well, be out. And that was a constant threat. Well, yeah, and I felt like not having a family, not being part of something, is very seductive. If 
someone calls it the family, which they did, you know, the family, the, this family that you were, I was terrified that that would, um, well, yeah, that, that would go, that would be taken. Of course, when it did, I was literally kicked out on my ass and um, controlled in, in that way to not speak about it. I but mean, that's, obviously, yeah. but, the, but that's how anymore. the spellbinding works, you know, sort of like, mm -hmm. I mean, um, you know, this technique uh, was learned from the Indians. Um, uh, and essentially, it's, it's also part of our part of our word, the uh, what we call the assassin came from hash hashish, you know, the, the, the people who smoke the marijuana. But mm -hmm. the way to get somebody into that mindset where they didn't care about their lives was quite interesting. They would drug the people, take them away from where they were into a make-believe world where there was champagne um, fountains, where there was opulent food, where there was beautiful women who would sleep with you. And you know the, the world was anything that you wanted. Then after a couple of days, they would re-drug you and take you back and say, oh, you died for a couple of days. What was it like? Oh, heaven was amazing. Now, essentially, they believe that's what happened to them when they died. So they were no longer fearful of death. This was the spell. And literally, the, the man who ran the assassins said that I can say to any one of my assassins, kill themselves and they will kill themselves. And he said, he showed, I think it was um, Marco Polo, I believe. He said, I can say to that man now, kill yourself and he will do it. And he did it and the man killed himself because essentially he believed in this illusion that was presented to him. Now in much the same way, when you meet powerful and manipulative people, they take you into the same kind of illusion where you are, really willing to give up all your sensibilities to appease these people who really realistically have no regard for for you and, and you know and, and this is like a very very dark side of, of the spell binding i mean there are good sides to the spell binding where like if we say back in the 80s we look at um, live aid i mean live aid on one level, it was totally negative. On another level, it was positive. But but the point, you know, the point being is is that, is that a couple of guys, for a brief time in history, spellbound the world to concentrate on something apart from themselves. Yeah, you know, and, and that was if you if you ever want to see pure magic in action, the first live aid was pure magic in action. Nothing had been done like that. And for the first time, the world, instead of examining themselves, looked to something else. You know, so in the other way, you know, the spellbinding is, is incredibly powerful, you know, to actually pull the whole world into an ideology of, of wanting to change something is amazing. But that same power can be inversed into a world that you're talking about. And unfortunately, you're older now and you can look back and you can understand what, why mentally you went into that position. But at the time, if I'd have spoke to you, I doubt you'd have been using words like this. You'd have probably been using words like exciting, power, wonderful, amazing. Well, oh I my did, God. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I did. To be fair on me, I, I went to see a Catholic priest. I remember where I was living and I went round to see him and I said, what they do makes me sick and I don't know how long I can deal with it. I don't know how long I can. And indeed, the reason why I brought in John Boyle is because I just got sick of them. I got sick of their attitude. I got sick of um, the way they um, the way they were with celebrities. It was kind of weird, kind of fawning. And just, I, I just thought it was kind of immature as well, as well as hurting people, the way they were of celebrities as if they were gods. Um, it sickened me, the whole thing um, sickened me. And I said to him, and he said, the more you get in touch with God, the more you'll have to uh, move away from it. And it was, um, you know, it was that, that I, I brought in Boyle, but then I didn't expect, you know, I went off to work for the Daily Mail and left them behind. Um, so I was only working for them for a few years. And, um, 
left them behind, thought good, uh, but oil then came in and brought the phone hacking and literally ruined it. So no private detectives were allowed in um, Fleet Street, but I enjoyed working. I enjoyed working for the Daily Mail. You know, I've got hacked off breathing down my neck, one in remittance advices, one in, oh, you, 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 you did um, illegal things for the Daily Mail. Actually, I didn't. It was more or less working as a journalist, you know. So I um, have to say, I did follow my own morals and spirituality mm. uh, during that time. I did give up um, money. Um, you know, it was less money for the yeah, mail. Maybe. And, okay, you know, I, I did have I, that going yeah. on. I agree Not you pulled point. out. I agree you pulled out. But it's like yeah, it's yeah, like yeah. it's it's like it's like the difference between a drug user and a, an addict. I think you tried the drug; it wasn't quite what you wanted. You pulled out. Now, if yeah. it was what you wanted, I doubt you would have pulled out. I think yeah, you got right. deep. Yeah. I think you'd have got deeper and deeper and deeper. So you know, so you know, so you know. Thank the gods, there was something in you, because essentially. For what you were saying, I think the only conclusion to that lifestyle is death, either spiritually or physically or both, because, you know, essentially you, 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 you're dealing with people who have no regard for you. And if you have if somebody has no regard for you, then then then, then you are just sort of, you know, expendable. Well, yeah, and what I, um, you know, there was a journalist who, who worked um, with a son and, you know, and I dated him. I thought he was a friend. And I remember, you know, after the whole, you know, we don't use private investigators, I, I rang him and he just put the phone down on me. And I thought, you know, what, what, the, what the hell is that? And literally, you know, that you just, you know, people in Fleet Street now, you know, my name is Persona Non Grata. If I rang them up, they'd put the phone down and I actually haven't even done anything. That's how psycho they are, you know, that they, um, they drop you. And when they drop you, you're just a non-person, you know, but, 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 but. But you can see it in every day, you know, you can see it sort of like in everyday life when somebody is popular with them and when somebody is unpopular with them. You know, I mean, you know, like, you know, uh, I hate to mention this because it's so cliched now, but 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 look at the lifestyle of Jimmy Savile. Yeah. OK. But he was always the darling of the press. Always. You know, I mean, you know, literally great charity worker. And, and realistically, once again, this this power of the spell. Look how charismatic Savile was. Some people I never thought he was charismatic. He, yeah. he had all that white hair. I mean, oh, yeah, but, I didn't uh, like him as a kid. I didn't really understand who did. It was like all that yodeling and oh, hello, guys and girls. I mean, yeah, I was yeah, forced yeah. to watch him as a kid. I hated him. I mean, he was yeah. kind of putrid. He wasn't good looking. No, he wasn't good looking, but 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 you know that. But he was essentially charismatic. You know, you know. He, so. Oh yeah, I mean, I mean, you, know, you look at his lifestyle. Look who, he, you know. It's not a question of who he was. It'd be a safer question to ask who wasn't influenced by him. You know, he was part of the Beatle mania. You know, he was part of that sixties pop culture. He was part of the seventies pop culture. You know, but 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 as time, you know, when after his death, it turned out that he was really quite a perverse, twisted character. But we never encountered this. Now, then we sort of skip on a few years. We've got people like was it um, Gary Glitter, for example? Yeah. yeah. He was now, good looking. Yeah, I can't Gary believe Glitter. it. When I was about seven, I thought he was gorgeous. It's weird, isn't it? Yeah, but but I mean, Gary Glitter, sort of like, um, you know, for like. Years, he was once again, he was like, you know, sort of, um, sort of promoted as this kind of, I don't know, sort of pop god. Yeah. And then all of a sudden they turned on him. Yeah. I don't know why they turned on him, but they turned on well, him. Well, he was a pedophile, wasn't he? They found stuff on his computer. Yeah. But, but do you really believe that a guy just suddenly turns into a pedophile? You know, sort of like, this is not natural. You know, if, if this guy's had this vent, he's had it all his career. And once again, it's, it, you know, it's, it's, it's been forgotten. But when it was, when it was, you know, when the, was it the powers that be decided they'd had enough of him, you know, Glitter, Paul Gad or Glitter, whatever you want to call him, was gone. You know, it's the same with the, you know, quite a lot of the um, sort of 70s sort of so-called icons. Suddenly they had a culling. Yeah. You know, sort of like Dave Lee Travis, um, sort of. Uh, who is the, the Australian guy? 
they they virtually murdered Bob Harris. Yeah, yeah, Bob Harris. You know, so it's, it's, no, 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 not Bob Harris. Uh, you know, the Australian guy. He's really, you know, tie my kangaroo down or Rolf Harris. Well, yeah, yeah. Yes. Rolf Harris. Yeah, they murdered him as well. You know, they murdered him publicly. I mean, sort of like you know. The, you know, all these icons that people used to admire and look up to, they just went through them with like a, with, 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 with like a scythe. And anything that you thought was, was was real was suddenly destroyed. Yeah, you know, like- But wasn't it, because, wasn't it because they actually were creeps? Yeah, but, but, they, no? must have been, but they must have been creeps all along. But, but, the press, yeah. but the press decided to only push a certain aspect of them. And then all of a sudden they decided they wanted rid. And so people who would like influence people, you know, like, you know, stars who had influenced people's lives for years and years were, so, you know, were suddenly persona non grata. You know, I mean, mm. it's sort of like, like, look at Rolf Harris. He painted the queen for God's sake. Mm. You know, yeah. And then all of a sudden he's persona I didn't ever like him though. Did you like him? He was a bit... Uh, I mean, uh, uh, I, I mean, realistically, I, I just watched it for entertainment. You know, I, I always presume, you know, he was like great at painting and stuff like this. And I, I used to enjoy what he did, you know, sort of, um, you know, I wouldn't say that he was a cultural icon for me, but he was certainly somebody who I found, you know, quite entertaining. You know, same with Savile, but I suppose that's the part of me that's always been drawn to the occult because, I mean, uh, I mean, Sp Savile used to say spells all the time. You know, sort of like jingle jangle, jingle jangle, and all this sort of stuff. You know, sort of like you know, it's it, it's um, it to me it was quite fascinating. But um, I certainly don't admire the person, and I was probably uh, shocked when when all this stuff came out about him. You know, I just thought it was all cheap publicity or whatever. You know, just to sell newspapers, and then the more it came out. I did watch. I did watch the um, interview with uh, was it? Uh, oh, the the famous interview that they did with him. Um, what was his name? The investigator. Uh, he went to invest. He went to. He he had a house in Scarborough, didn't he? He went to his house in Scarborough. Very famous um, investigator, Louis Peru. There you go. Like yeah, yeah, he, yeah. He he went to investigate him. And when I watched that interview. I must admit, sort of um, that, if you like, that spellbound was slightly broken because Savile came across to me as some kind of really weird guy after that interview, you know, sort of, um, but like, you know, we can all fall for this kind of spellbinding, which is, which is really awful. But as you pointed out to me quite happily and not probably realized, our if you like, spells are woven by very dark people. Yeah, you know, you're saying these people you used to work with, you used to hang around celebrities and things like this, because essentially, you know, the power works both ways. The darkness works both ways. They can glorify somebody or they can destroy somebody. You know, so the very people who have that power will push someone like Savile as this sort of like, you know, latter-day saint almost uh, knowing that realistically the guy is quite dark and on the other way where you've got somebody who won't go into their game they will paint as extremely dark so that they don't move up the ladder so to speak you know and, and this is the problem with the spell bind and you know it it, it takes a lot of strength of character one, to know that one is spellbound. And the other thing as well is to actually challenge your belief system. You know, sort of, um, an old magician told me there is, you know, everything is on sand. It really is. And it's, you know, and, and it's having the ability to understand that it's on sand. And- What about the, what about the rabbit dream? I mean, did somebody give me that or, or what? Well, I, I mean, there's sort of, this is all, you know, I mean, this is all part of the spell bind. I mean, I mean, I mean the rabbit is, is, is always, it's a weird one because it's always been a, 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 a the white rabbit has always been a, a creature of high spiritual significance. You know, um, it's, it, it's not ever classed as a demonic creature, the white rabbit. I mean, it features very strongly 
in um, Alice in Wonderland. You know, it's, it's the character that, 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 that pulls Alice through the whole sort of um, maze of people and characters and things like this. And, and, it, and it's always running out of time, et cetera, et cetera. But, but, the, but the White Rabbit is, is, is if you like, the, the, the central inspiration of the tale, as it is in the first um, Matrix. Uh, Neo is told to follow the White Rabbit. And once again, the White Rabbit brings him out of one level of consciousness into another level of consciousness in very much the same way that it, it does in Alice in Wonderland. Uh, well, it... Aquino, um, Michael Aquino, he, when I first emailed him and said about the MK Ultra and, you know, Alice in Wonderland mind control, he, I went to sleep and then I was trying to get to sleep and I saw it again, this, this is like five years after the first Murdoch White Rabbit, I saw this White Rabbit, and it was like really like in my face. And I thought, oh, I don't like that. Got up, washed my face, went back to bed. There it was again. And then it sort of, once it knew it, like kind of hooked a part of me, it kind of shot away vertically. And part of me came out of my, it was probably my astral body came out of my physical. I felt myself sit up, but not all my body sit up. Part of me sat up. And then I traveled across and then it traveled for a really long way. And then suddenly there was a dive down. It went down. I went down and then fell really, really down, down, down a long way and then landed bang in the middle of this, um, like a clearing. And there was Michael Aquino opposite me. And he said, what do you want from me? And um, I said, oh, I want to interview you. And he said, um, no, 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 I, what do you want from life? And um, I said, well, love, I suppose. And he took me down this like corridor came out we were looking at like the galaxy and he said climb inside this and it was like a weird shape within a shape I think it was maybe a Merkaba and he said climb inside that and you can go inside the consciousness of anybody you want throughout time and um I looked at him and I said what about Jesus though because I thought that's a bit naughty isn't it doing that so I said what about Jesus and as I said Jesus I found myself bang back on my bed um so that was a second white rabbit dream Mm. And then I emailed him again. I emailed Aquino um, because I thought, I spoke to the guy on Facebook friend and I said, this has happened. I, I was like, wow. And he said, that was your first interview. And I thought, well, I'm going to test this. I'm going to speak to the guy in reality and say, I just had this experience. Was that you? And he sent me back a link to that Grace. I um, can't remember her name. Jefferson Starship. Grace White Lick. Rabbit. Grace Lick. Yeah. Grace Lick. And he said, I know Grace. He said, now I'm going to have to get in contact with Grace and get her to alter the lyrics to include our little adventure. And he sent a link to the song, uh, the White Rabbit song. Um, so that wasn't a no, it didn't happen. And then after that, um, Aquino pulled me out of my body for a week through my feet, took me to like a detention room, asking me who I was. And um, that went on for a week. I had to get help from somebody to... Um, stop it happening it was it scared the shit out of me actually um and so that was my second encounter with a with a white rabbit i mean it must mean something well I mean, I mean, generally generally speaking you, you know you, 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 your white rabbit is is always um if you like um a, a significant creature of sort of you know, like love, look, loyalty, good relationships, stuff like this, spiritual awareness, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. However, that doesn't mean to say that you know, sort of like dark magicians can't use, can't inverse them and use them for something else. You know, uh, this is the trouble with the spell bound. You know, it's it, it, we're very often spell bound by the familiar, as as well as you know, as, as well as the spectacular. You know, it's it, it, it's. It, what what was Aquino doing at that point? Was he just questioning me? I've got no idea. I'm not Aquino, you know. But, but I mean, uh, if we look at it from a purely magical aspect, he's taking you from your reality into his reality, yeah, mm -hmm. and he's taking you without your consent. Mm. So you know, so once again, we're left with. I'm left with the impression. That it's dark magic because it doesn't care about what you think it just cares about i want you in this realm of consciousness 
in the same way that the sort of like religious zealots, even though they're pushing Jesus, take you from your realm of consciousness into their realm of consciousness. You know, like I said, there's very little difference between white and black magic apart. You know, actually, there isn't. There's very little difference between white and black magic. And so it's, um, what is the sorry, what is the him trying to get me into the Merkabah? Somebody said to me, Douglas Dietrich actually said to me that if I'd have got in that Merkabah, I wouldn't have come out. Well, once again, it's, you know, it's sort of like, it's not about you, is it? You know, it's, it's about the power they hold over you. And if that, you know, and, and all that points to me is very dark magic because they're not taking into consideration you as an individual, you as part of the sort of, you know, the cosmic oneness. They, they just want you in this aspect. You don't have any say, and uh, you know, uh, uh, and that to me shows magic, which is so incredibly dark. Yeah, and and, and you know, I'm not saying <laughs> I'm not judging the person, but the point is, is is you know, th th this is you know, taking something or somebody without their will is not really something I want to do but many people want to do this and realistically it's very very dark and I don't think that anybody in their right mind should be able to do that to somebody else but unfortunately we have triggers we have desires we have wants we have lusts and this is how the darker magic works. It hooks into the lust. It hooks into the wants. It hooks into the desires. When people have desire, they don't care about other people. And that once again envelops them more and more into the darker side of, you know, of, 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 of this magic. And realistically, I, I don't think to envelop yourself totally in something which is black and doesn't care about anybody else is, is, is quite diabolical. But in the same way, the same thing on the white side, if you're enveloping things and taking it in without ever taking one bit of concern about other people, it's equally as dark in a different manner. Uh, you know, if we look at, say, Mother Teresa, you know, the, the so-called saint, when you when I when I, I spent many years in India, when you speak to victims of Mother Teresa who were snatched from their homes and sold to couples in Sweden, oh. sorry, Switzerland, and they've lost their parents because Mother Teresa could make 25,000 by selling a beautiful Indian baby, you know, Boston. in the name in Jesus. Yeah, like I said, you know, th th this 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 whole aspect of white and black just disappears, you know, and the and, and the, the, the one thing that drives both is this absolute blind lust and need and want. And it's to me, it's quite horrific. And, uh, and unfortunately, because people are told, oh, magic is this magic is that it's all hocus pocus. They don't actually understand what is going on and the psychologists they're great because they explain this in such rational terms but trust me there's nothing rational about it you know that these people hook into your lust and desire and we can people, see what happens I mean, is, is that system of alice in wonderland magic is that used a lot well, I mean, sort of, you know, you, you know, he was a member of the Golden Dawn, so he was like pals with Crowley and sort of Mathers and stuff like this. You know, um, they were ceremonial magicians and they were ceremonial magicians of like high standing. And um, it's it's like anything else. It's, you know, power is such a strange animal. You know, sort of like, uh, I, I, I forget which Russian philosopher said it, but, but he said that... Uh, power often hands ends up in the hands of those who can least afford to use it and that is the trouble is that you know this is if you speak to sort of like you know magicians who care about their craft they will always tell you or buddhists or sort of hinduists they will always tell you that the ego is really really bad because it's the ego that will sort of drive people to do such you know sort of awful things 
uh, and this is why you know sort of staying centered and, and staying within yourself and understanding that that, that you know that, that, that the other people are equally as valuable as yourself is so important and this is the trouble like we, we've seen it reoccur and reoccur i mean the the whole the, the whole covid thing reintroduced the witch hunt again you know sort of like it also reintroduced the restrictions on sex it it, it it started to imprison people it sort of the fallout from this was people dying needlessly suicide it's all very dark and demonic but it starts from a spellbind and once people are in that spellbound and they can't break out of it they're at the mercy of the magicians who will manipulate them and who are the magicians that's the million dollar question but I can assure well, you, you know, that I can assure you that that these were high-level magicians who came up with uh, the COVID. Really? Oh God, yeah. Look how many people have affected. It's the whole world. Look how many people have the same belief system without question. Look how many people wear the masks without question. Look how many people. Won't Don't mention the you know who. Don't mention the Maxine. We're not allowed to on YouTube. Well, no. you, it might crash the channel. Don't okay. mention that. Right. Well, the, you know what? But people, I noticed, Brian, that people were, talk, you know, talking about getting the max bean um, with almost a reverence. Well, of course. Like, it's, and was, it's, it's all part of the spell. It's all part of the spell yeah. bound. But, but, but look and there how were groups that there were groups of friends who were like, oh, I've done it. Have you done it? I've done it. And they were like accepting each other. And there's one guy who said his brother, um, got sick and someone said are you going to get it still as his brother and he was like yeah and it was almost like a kind of anybody saying that they weren't going to wouldn't be accepted in in the club of course you know, that's how the spell works i mean unfortunately um my mother was um 84 and after making the worst choice of her life was dead three days later this is not this you know this, this is this no, 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 no problem. But I mean, the, the, you know, I actually warned her that this would like likely to be the outcome of it. And of course, she ignored me because she said that I was just a paranoid idiot. Thank you, mother. But um, the whole point is, 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 you know, this is how the bind works is, is that, you know, you, you're soon encapsulated with this enthusiasm and power. Yeah, you know, and you have this sort of like, you know, wonderful ego filling sort of um, desire that you are now better than anybody else and there's also a very perverse angle to it i've had the injection and i wasn't killed therefore everybody else is a liar and i'm the only virtuous one you know it's a, you know it's essentially that you know that that's roughly you know how these magician work they they, they they tie into your lust and your desire nothing else nothing more and nothing so where, where do these where do these magicians live i mean are they controlling the whole planet or, or what the magicians have always controlled the whole planet oh i see well, and where do they live i mean do they run the corporations okay, or uh, i can only talk about what i know right we have to go back to the time of elizabeth the second yeah okay and who controlled more or less a great chunk of her life no other than the magician john d that is where 007 comes from if you put your hand like this 007 when oh, she was see. whenever she was in trouble or under threat he would write on a garment or a, a door 007 so when she went into the when she went into the room she understood that she was in danger or there was something to look out for or she was not to go into the room yeah and now essentially we know through history that john dean was a, a an astrologer he was a necromancer he spoke to the dead he spoke to the angel was it nadini yeah um he invented a language where you could speak to the, speak to the angels this guy had direct access to Queen Elizabeth II, the so-called Christian Queen. So, mm. you know, you know, so you know, are you telling me this is the 20th sort of you know first century and things have changed? Of course they haven't changed. I mean, look at Savile. I mean, Savile Savile allegedly was the seventh son of the seventh son, wasn't he? 
And once again, mm. he had direct access to Charles and the royal family. You know, sort of like, th these guys don't disappear. You know, they, they get clever at hiding themselves. But when you start scratching the surface, they come up all over the place. And once again, they hook into what the people want. They want the desire. They want the lust. They want the wealth. They want the power. It, and, and it pulls them into people's lives. You know, so, we, yeah, I would categorically say through what we understand about D, that the magician, the astrologer, has always been connected with the ruling class. And if we go to the 80s, when we are so much more sophisticated, Ronald Reagan's wife had a full-time astrologer. Yeah? Ronald uh, Reagan yeah, yeah. had a full-time astrologer. We are told he's an astrologer or she's an astrologer. I can't remember who it was, but the point being is, is, you know, with all their analysts and sort of very, very clever people, why are they going into the sort of, you know, the art of astrology? Hmm. You know, and, and who is this astrologer? Yeah. Princess Diana, another one who sort of like, you know, was, was, was absolutely obsessed with astrology. Hmm. You know, so like I said, you know, the, the, you've only got to scratch the surface and the, and the, and the cultism just, just, just appears. Hmm. Yet we are told that none of this is um, worth doing. All of it is garbage and it's not worth touching, you know. Or evil. <laughs> or evil, yeah. Yet, yet, you know, so that you, you know, it's sort of, a, as they say, you know, you can judge the tree by the fruit that, you know, comes from it. Mm, mm, mm. And, you know, I think that's, you know, you, you have to go by the evidence, not by what you are told. Yeah, I mean, you can go in, like, for example, the very famous um, Lincoln Cathedral Church. One of the one part of the church is full of astrological symbols. Yeah, we don't we don't see that anymore connected with Christianity. However, when that when that cathedral was was built, it was important enough to have the astrological symbols built into one of the chapels. Hmm. You know, so, you know, it, 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 once again, like I said, this is trouble with the spell. It's everywhere. You may not recognize it, but it's always there. Mm, mm. Oh, brilliant. Well, thank you no. for coming on. I think we've come to the um, end of the time. Um, that's been great. I really found that interesting. And I'm sure the listeners have enjoyed you and, and want you to come back again. And it's been cool. excellent. Thank you for educating me. I've made loads of notes. Well, I've, I've, I was quite shocked by your stories, by the way. Yeah. Oh, were you? Sorry. No, 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 no. I mean, sort of like, um, I think there's, it's always that moment where you suspect something, but then you've, then the reality of it is how you presume it is, you know, uh, and, it, uh, and that's always very difficult to deal with, you know, but anyway. Mm. I don't know what always... the Alice in Wonderland thing is. I mean, I've always been fascinated by Alice in Wonderland. I've got you know, collectibles of Alice in Wonderland and just seems to go into my dream life. I don't really understand it. I mean, maybe somebody out there can comment below if they know more about it. Well, I mean, you, you, uh, I mean, I, I mean, we can look at the esoteric structure sometime of Alice in Wonderland. I mean, it's sort of like, I mean, I mean there's a, but realistically, uh, Alice, Alice in Wonderland is a, is a mixture of the esoteric and chess, which is a very, very strange one. It's actually a chess game, you know, Alice in Wonderland. Is it? Yeah, it's a weird one. It's a what, very, very um, what, what is the esoteric, just quickly, the esoteric structure of, of will, Alice in Wonderland? Then? It, will, it will just take far too long, realistically, to go through. But who, I mean, is, who, is, who is the caterpillar? Alistair Crowley. You're kidding me. No. Who are you? The opium-smoking caterpillar is Mr Crowley himself. It's creepy that we're given this to read as a kid, is it not? A little bit. Well, it uh, freaking I mean, well is. Well, I, I, I mean, I, I don't really know. I was brought up on this stuff, so I don't really know. So was I. You know, um, so, hang on, and the Cheshire Cat? The Cheshire Cat that disappears. Yeah, who's that? That's for another show. 
that's creepy. Interestingly, when I met um, the Hillside Strangler, Kenneth Bianchi, not only did he pull out a chessboard, so I played chess with him, I yeah. kept thinking to myself, I'm going to have to get smaller and smaller and smaller till I fit in his world and see what went on there. There was this whole Alice thing going on there with him that I thought, I kept thinking, I have to get really small. And if I get really small, I can uh, find out what went on. And then I was looking at him and it's like, almost like, he seemed like he was the caterpillar. Strange. So I've written that in the book, but suddenly yeah. I looked at him and saw the caterpillar. Well, there you go. I mean, you know, this is how powerful the spellbind is. You're a grown woman it's... in a prison with a murderer and you see him as nothing more than Mahuka. But, but you're saying that was Crowley, so it's not such a silly caterpillar, right? There's nothing silly about Mahuka. <laughs> no, it's sort of like he's he's he's, he's very um, yeah he's 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 a very strange central character is Mahuka. You know who Tell are you? Tell me more about him then. No, no, because the, the letter it's over for another for another one we can go on it, but just be, be rest assured that um, it's very he's a very interesting guy because essentially you know that the the, the whole inspiration for um or, for for the Alice in Wonderland. Is that is a, is a church in Beverly, in um, in in Yorkshire, yeah. Really? You can, yeah, you can go to the church and you can see the Cheshire Cat in the sim in the ceiling. You can see the uh, the big door and the small door. You can see the wow. uh, the white rabbit. You can actually, yeah, I think it's Saint Mary's. It's called the church. It's called Saint Mary's. I've actually been there many many times. Um, yeah, it's it's an amazing place to go and visit, and you can and. Uh, that's where he, as a boy, he he's because his father was a rector. He spent most of his time, and that's where most of the inspiration from Alice in Wonderland came from. Came from the church in Beverly. You can go round it, and they've painted the all the aspects of the various characters that you can read in the book. They're all in that church. Wow! So that was there before he wrote the book, or some of it was there before he wrote the book. Well, well, the actual rabbit is not the rabbit, of course, because the um, sort of like, you know, many, many thousands of years ago, rabbits were introduced by the Romans. So that so the the the, the rabbit is indeed the hare. Yeah. And of course, the hare is um, ties in beautifully with um, the worship of um, Astarte, Ishtar, et cetera, et cetera, you know, because, the, you know, the. the the hair is always um, it's in the pagan influence. The hair is always barking at the moon. Is always praying to the moon. Yeah, and mm -hmm. and the medieval people thought that the the, the hair was a mystical animal because you'd only see it on moonlit nights and things like this. So, you know, sort of like you know. So there's a there's a there's quite an inversion to the white rabbit. Is the white rabbit truly a white rabbit or is it the hair? And, you know, is in fact, is it representative of um, Astarte, you know, or, or Ishtar or something like this, you know, sort of like, and this completely twists the, the whole journey of Alice. You know, but like How I said, did it like, twist it? I'm not going to tell you because that's for another one or another one. This will be like a four hour sort of uh, book podcast. Oh, please tell me just before you go. No, what no, what would you mean her you. journey? Her journey is a kind of a, a an enlightenment journey, is it? Possibly, possibly. You know, if, if, if you understand that the that the hair is um, the hair is Astarte or Ishtar, then it then yeah. it suddenly becomes very sort of a, it becomes very inversed. Yeah, you know, the, and the whole thing about the you know the descending before one can ascend, et cetera, et cetera. But like I said, it's very much for another, another podcast because it's, it's a very intriguing story. And, there are, and, and he was a member of the Golden Dawn, which is, which is quite interesting. You know? But anyway, on that, I will say namaste. And I hope you find time to heal from your awful experience. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. That was great. Yeah. And just wow. Okay. Well, thank you. See you later. Bye. <laughs>